You know, beauty definitely is in the eye of the beholder. And I've been collecting these face jugs for years now, and they're definitely not everyone's taste. They're what you might consider unusual. So that's what we're focusing on in today's show, things that are out of the ordinary. Whether it's a unique planter, obscure wall hangings, or a pizza topped with a fried egg, today we're gonna to do something different. And we're gonna start by making flower arrangements with something you'd normally put on your dessert. We're gonna have some fun today, so don't go away. You know, I've always just loved the color blue, and anytime I can set a table, whether it's inside or outside, when I can use blue, well, I always try to. It's so refreshing, and it's so calming. And in this particular table setting, I've used a very old pattern, which is called a blue willow plate. It was first introduced by an English potter by the name of Thomas Minton in about 1790. And these plates can be found in all sorts of stores. In fact, all of these are a mixture of plates that I've picked up at flea markets and estate sales and so forth. But the blue willow pattern, as it's called, is probably one of the most recognizable patterns you can use. And what you get with this is you get a mandarin's garden. Uh, here is the mandarin's pagoda. You can see the mandarin and his hunting party crossing the bridge. There's the bridge, here's the garden. There's also a fisherman in the plate here who saves the lovers and their hideaway is here on a little island, and the lovers are represented here with these two birds. And then, well, of course, the willow, and there's the willow tree where the name Blue Willow comes from. So what I've done is I've taken this old pattern and integrated it into a place setting here uh, for this little dinner party. What I've used here is a round rattan placemat, and then this cobalt blue water glass a wine glass, and then just some basic ceramic blue dessert plates that I found, and then just some small blue willow bowls for slices of lemon to go in. And then look at the arrangements themselves, and you can see here we've used blueberries floating in the water to carry out the blue theme, stems of blueberries from the garden, and then the complementary color to blue is yellow, these beautiful yellow Asiatic lilies, and then creamy white to chartreuse hydrangeas. I think they're really spectacular. We have six of these arrangements through the center where people can enjoy talking back and forth across the table from one another. Of course, one of the nicest things about these arrangements is that you can pluck the blueberries off the stems and eat them after the dinner party's over. And in this setting of the garden, I love it because you can hear the sound of the water in the pool below. And then this time of year, these vitex trees, which bloom blue or a lavender blue, this variety is called Shoals Creek, are just about to come into peak flower. So it's the perfect time to have a blue themed dinner party. You know, when you think about gardening, you never think about gray really as a color. So many other colors to think about when it comes to flowers. There's something about gray foliage that is so beautiful with flowers. Just look at this bed, for instance. Here it is in the spring, and I've got this Artemisia Poes Castle back here. And just look at this lamb's ear. This is called Helen von Stein. It's the big-eared lamb's ear. Now this lamb's ear will actually produce a flower. It's not very showy. I tend to grow it strictly for its gorgeous foliage. But then there are gray foliage plants that bloom, like this one called yellow flambe. It's actually chrysocephalum, which is sort of a big name for a plant that has a lot of merit. Just look at all the flower power this little guy has. And this plant will bloom from now until the first frost. It's really great. Now what I found with these gray foliage plants, including the lavender that I'm planting in this container, is they really need sharp drainage. They don't like wet feet. So you wanna make sure that you have a lot of sand worked into the soil and doesn't hold too much moisture. 
The other thing is that most of them really like full sun. So you want at least six hours of sunlight for these type of plants for them to perform really well. Now this particular type of lavender is one called Provence. And one of the reasons I love it is it's one of the lavenders that actually does well for me here. And what I've learned is the reason it does well is that I always plant it in containers and I make sure there's plenty of sand. Just look at all the sand that's in the soil that these were grown in. Now in just a few months, these plants will fill out this entire container and they'll begin to bloom. These gorgeous lavender colored blooms. The foliage itself is so fragrant and makes it worth growing. I won't place this particular container in a saucer, which is something I usually encourage people to do to keep the soil consistently moist because these plants don't like too much water around their roots, just like I said about these guys over here. You know, gray is just such a wonderful harmonizing color. It makes everything feel more tranquil. I have gray gravel here, and even the teak has weathered to a beautiful sort of gray patina. So when you have so much gray around and then you have blooms like this, it allows the blooms to really step out and show off. This interesting looking plant behind me is one called a smoke tree. It's one of my favorite ornamental plants. Now to be a little more precise, it's called a purple smoke tree because of its red leaves and purple smoky plumes, or in this case, blooms. Now this plant is not just a pretty face. It'll grow in a wide range of conditions like take soil, acidic, alkaline, whether your soil is sandy or loamy or well clay, but it has to be well drained clay it will thrive in all of these soils. It's also drought tolerant. So you're saying, okay, this is too good to be true. What's the catch here? Well, if there's any catch, the smoke tree doesn't like wet, soggy ground. So if you have a low, wet, boggy area, this is not the plant for you. If you're not into this color purple, you can go with a different colored smoke tree. They come in a marvelous chartreuse color, which I think is very electric, as well as just an ordinary green smoke tree. Now I want you to take a closer look at this bloom it's really exotic looking. You can see why I'm crazy about it because it's so, well, it's so interesting. So you can imagine how these would make a sensational addition to a flower arrangement. Now that will have your neighbors talking. I just think it's marvelous. The other interesting thing about it is these round or ovate leaves have the distinct aroma of crushed orange peels. So give smoke tree a try. It's a really interesting plant, aren't you? Yes, you look like Cousin It. Now, if you were driving along a highway and saw a bunch of cows, you probably wouldn't think anything about it. But if you saw this bunch of animals, I think most people would want to stop and take a look. These buffalo here at Ratchford Farms live a, live a very stress-free life next to the beautiful Buffalo National River. It's close to the original way that they were raised as possible. They own approximately 500 acres of wooded hills, hollers. They've got uh, 11 live springs. They are free flowing, run year round. We have them tanked and piped into uh, different pastures. Here in this herd, we've got approximately uh, 40 to 45 head, this is our breeding herd. You can see that they are very well treated, very well fed, and uh, you can taste it in their meat. Very low in cholesterol, fat, high in the vitamin B vitamins, as well as iron. And also a serving of buffalo meat has the same amount of potassium as a banana. There's a growing trend toward the leaner, healthier meats, such as the buffalo meat. And we sell to a lot of health food stores, and we've even started selling to some chains of grocery stores. I would like to encourage anyone who has never tried buffalo meat to, to get a burger, go someplace, try it.
Now, Janet, one of the hallmarks of Arkansas House is that you actually serve buffalo and elk. Yes, we have the opportunity to do that here. Both of these meats were indigenous to Newton County. These are beautiful cuts of meat. Well, these are, they are the tenderloin of buffalo, the tenderloin of elk, and you can see the difference in the meat, uh, just as color. Well, there's no fat in them. No fat. That What's comes fat? from everything being grass-fed, as free range as possible. They are only about 7% fat, whereas a confined animal on grain might be about 30% fat. So with, with less fat, you, you need to cook them a little longer. Yes, you'll right. have you'll have a longer time to get it to medium rare as opposed to a more marbleized piece of meat because the fat is what allows the heat to travel through yeah, the piece of meat. Yeah, it's a good conductor of heat. Yes, so and it so quicker. it's going up through the meat where this the meat actually has to get hot to cook, mm -hmm. and so you're you're searing it on both sides, but you are waiting also for the meat to actually cook to the medium rare. And again, we don't take these kinds of meat past medium rare. You know, it's marvelous. This is very local in that you're, you, these are two indigenous mammals that were in this part of the world. Yeah. The Buffalo River is named after the buffalo. Right. I mean, how much more local can you get than this? And the ranch where these are raised, well, it's just several miles from here. Yes, Elsie Ratchford of Ratchford Meats raises our meats for our cafe, and he's still on the river and conforms to all of our organic standards, as do all of our farmers that contribute to the cafe. Marvelous. I can't wait to try it. I love fruit, all kinds of fruit, and particularly a fruit salad. Now, there are some fruits out there that are pretty unusual, like the pineapple. Now, it has a really, I think, quirky shape. I mean, look at the body, the top. It looks like it's got a funny little hairdo on top. You know, if you like this shape and form, you can actually find it in your flower bed. Let me show you what I mean. I want you to meet the pineapple lily. Just look at this, isn't it unique? I just love the shape of this plant. You see, there's the body of the pineapple, and there's that little top or crest of foliage that we see on the fruit itself. What's extraordinary about these blooms is that the flower spikes come up about 18 to 24 inches high, and they're a beautiful plant for contrasting with other plants. As you can see in this bed, I have this little Cleome here in the foreground, in the back some grasses, and you can see these are the perfect contrasting flower for this area in the bed. Now, from a cultural standpoint, you need to understand that, well, Eucomus, or pineapple lily, likes well-drained soils. It doesn't like to sit in water. It also loves full sun. As you can see here, they're thriving. Now, another point I want to make about this plant is that they're easily grown in containers, perfect for a small space. And you can also cut them. They're long-lasting cut flowers. I mean, they'll last for weeks if you'll keep the water clean. So if you're looking for a plant that's out of the ordinary, you really ought to give these pineapple lilies a try. Now we've all heard of mushrooms and pepperoni on a pizza, but how about a fried egg? Yep, the guys over at Hog and Hominy will put a fried egg on just about everything. Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Andrew, I'm very eager to learn some of the secrets behind your pizza making here. I'm excited to talk about it. All right, let's do it. All right, so uh, we got our dough that we let rise for nine hours uh, over here. Baby pizza doughs. So what we like to do is put in a little uh, mound of flour here. We start gently working the uh, circular motion. Now you guys are really focused on local food. Yeah, yeah, we're completely uh, well, local farm driven ingredients here. From our pork to our lamb to beef and all the vegetables. Right. And we use a slap dough method. Mm -hmm. We extract the pizza. Right, get it the size Stretch you want. Stretch it out a little bit. Yep, take it over here. All right, so from here you're gonna build it, okay? All right. So I'll take a little, uh, just we usually start off with a little cream and a little olive oil. 
Oh, uh, yeah? Now, this actual pizza here was inspired when we lived in Calabria. We used to love uh, cacio e pepe pasta. This is more popular in Rome. Right. Um, so we take lots trips of pepper. up there. Lots of pepper. We take yep. trips up there. When we came back to Memphis and opened this place. We were getting this beautiful cauliflower from Oxford. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mikey came up with the idea. I was just kind of inspired by it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, take, oh, we take cauliflower, pecorino, and herbs. We chop them up together. We put them in a food processor a couple of times. So that's going to be the base of the pizza you'll sprinkle around on right. the pie. Right. So that's just all mixed together. So we you want to go ahead and put it on there now? Yeah, yeah I'll see okay. that. All right, so it has sort of the consistency of grits or meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yep. It's talking about a, about a third of a cup. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. And we'll just kind of smash it down a little bit. All right. All right, excellent. You got to get now, your hands uh, in a pizza. There you go. So right. this is actually ready. I'm going to switch places with you real quick. All right. I'm going to go ahead and drop Do this. A little dance here. Yeah. So that goes in next. That's right. So this will go in here. But so what's your temperature in there right now, Andrew? We, we usually run it about 800. And you're just using what, white oak? Uh, we use red oak. Red oak. Mm -hmm. And it's all from this area, too. Mm -hmm. um, right. So that's, that's kind of doing its thing. We got the egg ready here. So the egg goes right in the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll just drop it right on there on the first turn, and then we'll rotate it a couple more times just so the egg kind of crust will be finished at the same time. Well, the first time I had this, I was surprised when it came out and had the egg. I thought it was a wonderful addition. Yeah, we love eggs on, we love eggs in general on everything, <laughs> especially on pizza. So do I. Yeah. We usually turn it three times. Once you see the uh, the edge get start to get a little brown on, on the side closest to the fire, yeah. that's when we'll kind of pull it's it out. It's coming up. You know, yeah. 800 degrees, it's just not going to sit there. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's looking nice. You're turning it three times because it's obviously hotter on the fire side. Right, right, right. Yep. So I'll pull this up front. There we go. You want to drop this egg on there? Yeah, right in the middle. Right in the middle. So Andrew, what do you think the egg does? Uh, Ma'am, our favorite part about it is when, because it doesn't fully cook the egg, so when, right. we, when we pull it out and, we, and that yolk breaks up and mixes with the cauliflower mm -hmm. and the cheese and the pepper, it makes this, it's just like an awesome little sauce on the pizza. There we go. So I'll slide that right back in there. Mother Nature sauce, the egg. That's right, that's right. Rotate it a little bit. Yep, there it goes. And it's, let that go it's for another few minutes. Back there. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty hot. It's pretty warm. We'll let that go for another few minutes. So it looks like you're ready to pull it out. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's coming right along now. It's looking yeah. nice. Okay, we'll slide it to the front. Okay. The egg just gotten cooked. Timed it nicely with the uh, browning of the crust. We'll slide this guy underneath there. And we'll pull it over here to the front. Mm-hmm. Beautiful now for the, for the topping, we'll take uh, some of this pecorino. So you take the pecorino, you make a little, little bit of crisp on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love and how salty that is. Oh, it's awesome. I love yep. it. And then you'll take some goat cheese. I'll sprinkle this on there as well. Just kind of all around. Mm-hmm. Looks great. There's a little salt on the egg. Mm-hmm. A little bit around. And, and the, the pepper. last thing is just, mm -hmm. just a lot of cracked pepper. Coarsely ground. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah. And the herbs that you used in the cauliflower were just some rosemary and some thyme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at that. That's beautiful, Andrew. That's it. Simple, basic, local ingredients. That's right. Yeah, you keep the chickens in the back here, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Man, love this. Mm-mm-mm. You know, this time of year, I like to give a container a little bit of a makeover. You know, through the summer, they get a little tired. It's time to go to the nursery, pick out a few plants, do something creative. And we've done something really creative here. You see, I took a stump, a hollowed out stump, and turned it into a container. Well, it's not my idea. It happens in nature all the time. I just took inspiration from her. So what I did is I have this container, which is hollowed out. It was a hollowed out tree. It was cut off at about 18 inches. A piece of plywood was applied to the bottom to hold the soil. Now, there's no reason to drill holes in the bottom of this board because the water will drain from around the edges. The next step was just simply fill it with a good quality grade potting soil, one designed for container gardening. Next came the plants, which really for me is the most fun part. I used some grasses here at the back. In the middle, I found some solidago or goldenrod. A lot of people think goldenrod causes hay fever. It really doesn't. It's a beautiful fall plant. And then I filled in here with some fillers and a few things to spill over the edge in the way of the scavola and the verbena. So I've got a thriller, 
a filler, and a spiller. You can remember that. Now let's get back to these containers because I think they're really cool. You see, I added this stump container to this side of the entry to this cabin so it would create a sense of balance here at the entry point. I have a cluster of three smaller stumps here planted with a variety of things, but the colors all work together. We have purple, we have pink, and we have a touch of yellow on both sides. And hey, look how this sweet potato vine has responded to this particular container or stump. You see, I didn't have to really do much of a makeover with it. I just love its bronzy foliage. It's perfect for the onset of fall. Granted, rustic stump containers might not be everyone's taste, but in this wooded landscape and with this charming cottage, I think they're the perfect fit. And hey, why not experiment, get creative, and step out of your comfort zone? I have to say, when I visit someone's house, I'm always interested in the objects that they have surrounding them. And I like houses, and usually the people that own the houses, that have interesting things, curious things, almost whimsical things, beyond just paintings hanging on the wall. Like, take a look at this horse up here, a model taken from a harness maker's shop. Interesting. And then, take a look at these objects, this and this. These are pieces from farm implements, but I think they have a really unique design. The silhouette against a white wall looks really good. And then remember how we took all those old farm tools and clustered them together and created a focal point for over the mantle? Of course, another thing to hang on the wall, which isn't so surprising but can be really good looking, are just platters. Maybe they're all in neutral colors. They blend nicely with the decor. Then there are things like baskets picnic hampers, fishing creels, or even this big old tobacco basket that goes back to the 19th century. It has a great modern look. And I love things like this, this vintage or even antique hay fork made of wood, fits perfectly in this hallway. It doesn't interfere with the way you can come up and down the hall, it's flat against the wall and it really is a symbol of our farmhouse chic approach that we've taken to this little cottage. You know, things aren't always as they seem. So that's why it pays to dig a little deeper, check out things you really don't know. Hey, if you've come across something fun and unusual, I'd love to see it. Post it on my Facebook page. You never know, it might show up in next year's shows. Until next time for The Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. And hey, get out there and get your hands in the soil. Of course, the greatest thing about these arrangements is these stems with blueberries on them can be Okay. These are two indigenous mammals that were in this part of the world. Yes. The Buffalo River is named for the buff. The Buffalo River is named after the buffalo. Right. I mean, how much more local can you get than this and the ranch that? It, it's just all. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like where you're going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Based on it. Okay. More than alkaline, 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 alk